Welcome to the journal. With all due respect, we can only wish those Tea Party activists who gathered this week were not so single-minded about just who's responsible for their troubles, real and imagined. They're up in arms, so to speak, against big government, especially the Obama administration. But if they thought this through, they'd be joining forces with other grassroots Americans who will soon be demonstrating in Washington and elsewhere against high finance, taking on Wall Street and the country's biggest banks. The original Tea Party, remember, wasn't directed just against the British Redcoats. Colonial patriots also took aim at the East India Company. That was the joint stock enterprise originally chartered by the first Queen Elizabeth. Over the years, the government granted them special rights and privileges, which the owners turned into a monopoly over trade, including tea. It may seem a stretch from tea to credit default swaps, but the principle is the same. When enormous private wealth goes unchecked, regular folks get hurt badly. That's what happened in 2008 when the moneyed interests led us up the garden path to the great collapse. Suppose the Tea Party folk had dropped by those Senate hearings this week looking into the failure of Washington Mutual. That's the bank that went belly up during the meltdown in September 2008. It was the largest such failure in American history. WAMU, as we were reminded this week, made subprime loans that its executives knew were rotten, then packaged them as mortgage securities and pawned them off on unsuspecting investors. And that was your responsibility to make sure that the securities which went out to the investors were following notice to the investors of everything that they needed to know in order that the information be complete and truthful. That's what your testimony is under oath. It's a very real possibility that the loans that went out were better quality than Mr. Shaw laid out. And, and you it's don't a very real possibility. Yeah, and there's a very good possibility that they were exactly the quality that he laid out, right? Is that right? That's right. Okay. And you don't know, and apparently you don't care. And the trouble is, you should have cared. Then there's Lehman Brothers. During those black September days a year and a half ago, the feds decided to let Lehman go. This led to America's biggest bankruptcy ever. In an admirable work of journalism this week, the New York Times reported that Lehman secretly controlled a company called Hudson Castle and used it to borrow money as well as to hide bad investments in commercial real estate and subprime mortgages. But the week's award for sheer gall goes to a Chicago area hedge fund called Magnetar, named after a kind of neutron star that spews deadly radiation across the galaxies. Thanks to the teamwork of the investigative reporting website ProPublica, NPR's Planet Money Project, and This American Life, we learned Magnetar worked with investment banks to create toxic CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, securities backed by subprime mortgages the management knew were bad. And then Magnetar took that knowledge and bet against the very same investments they had recommended to buyers, selling short and making a fortune. And late this week, the Securities and Exchange Commission charged the godfather of Wall Street, Goldman Sachs, with fraud in earning a $15 million fee involving those complex CDOs, a hedge fund, and the housing market. But since we know all this, why is it so hard to hold Wall Street accountable? Even as we speak, the banking industry and corporate America are fighting against financial reform with all the money and influence at their disposal. Their effort is to preserve a system that would enable them to ransack the country once again. So even if the Tea Party folks saw the light, what can ordinary Americans do? That's the question I want to put to my guests, Simon Johnson and James Kwok. They've written this new book, 13 Bankers, The Wall Street Takeover and the Next Financial Meltdown. It's a must read, already a bestseller, and it couldn't have come at a better time. This book could change the debate over financial reform by tipping it in favor of the public. Simon Johnson is a former chief economist at the International Monetary Fund. He now teaches at MIT's Sloan School of Management and is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. James Kwok is studying law at Yale Law School, a career he decided to pursue after working at McKinsey & Company and co-founding the successful software company Guidewire. Together, James Kwok and Simon Johnson run the indispensable economic website, BaselineScenario.com. Welcome to you both.
Thanks. Let me get to the blunt conclusion you reach in your book. You say that two years after the devastating financial crisis of 08, our country is still at the mercy of an oligarchy that is bigger, more profitable, and more resistant to regulation than ever. Correct? Absolutely correct, Bill. The big banks became stronger as a result of the bailout. That may seem extraordinary, but it's really true. They're turning that increased economic clout into more political power, and they're using that political power to go out and take the same sort of risks that got us into disaster in September 2008. And your definition of oligarchy is? Oligarchy is just a, is a very simple, straightforward idea from Aristotle. It's political power based on economic power, and it's the rise of the banks in economic terms, which we document at length, that they turn into political power, and they then feed that back into more deregulation, more opportunities to go out and take reckless risks and, and capture huge amounts of money. And you say that these this oligarchy consists of six mega banks. What are the six banks? They are Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo. And you write that they control 60% of our gross national product? They have assets equivalent to 60% of our gross national product. And to put this in, in perspective, in the mid-1990s, these six banks, or their, their predecessors, since there have been a lot of mergers, had less than 20%. Their assets were less than 20% of gross national product. And what's the threat from an oligarchy of this size and scale? They can distort the system, Bill. They can uh, change the rules of the game to favor themselves. And, and unfortunately, the way it works in modern finance is when the rules favor you, you go out and you take a lot of risk and you blow up from time to time because it's not your problem. When it blows up, it's the taxpayer and it's the government that has to sort it out. So you're not kidding when you say it's an oligarchy. Exactly. I think that in particular, we can see how the oligarchy has actually become more powerful in the last, since the financial crisis. If we look at the way they've behaved in Washington, for example, they've been spending more than $1 million per day lobbying Congress and fighting financial reform. I think that for, for some time, the, the financial sector got its way in Washington through the power of ideology, through the power of persuasion, and in the last year and a half, we've seen the gloves come off. They are fighting as hard as they can to stop reform. I know people uh, react um, a little negatively when you use this term for the United States, but it means political power derived from economic power. That's what we're looking at here. It's, it's disproportionate. It's unfair. It, it is very unproductive, by the way. It undermines business in this society. And it's an oligarchy like we see in other countries. And you say they continue to hold the global economy hostage? Exactly, because what's happened, what we learned in, in 2008 was certain institutions are so big and so interconnected that if they were to fail, they would cause systemic shocks throughout the economy. That's essentially what happened in September 2008 when Lehman Brothers uh, collapsed. And what's remarkable, and I think what, what essentially proves the point of our book, is that almost two years later, nothing has changed. Or the only thing that has changed is that these banks have gotten larger, more powerful, both economically and politically. And they've been flexing their muscles in Washington for the last year and a half. So uh, Neil Wolin, the Deputy Treasury Secretary, gave a blistering speech to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in which he said, look, the financial sector has been spending more than $1 million per day lobbying against the reforms we need to fix the financial system. Now, Simon and I think those reforms that the administration has proposed do not go far enough, but we think they're certainly better than nothing. What Wall Street wants is they want nothing. They want, they want to stop this in its tracks and go back to where we were five years ago. It's amazing, Bill, but this is, this is politics and this is money. And, you know, there's a ground game, which is campaign contributions, which are surging in, I'm sure, on both sides of the aisle. And there's also the ideological space. It's amazing. The Chamber of Commerce that claims to represent this broad cross-section of American business is siding with six big banks who favor policies that are directly contrary to the interests of most of the membership of the Chamber of Commerce. And that's just, not just me saying that, that's Neil Wolin, that's Treasury, that's the White House saying that now, calling, fortunately they've come to the point where they're willing to call the Chamber of Commerce on that, but I don't know if that message is getting through to people. You see, what the bankers have done is they've taken a, a basic principle which is more or less true, which is that free financial markets do enable money to go to the places where people need it. But on top of that, they have erected a system that is indescribably complex and gives them many opportunities to make money at the expense of their customers, at the expense of their counterparties, even at the expense of their own employers. So one of the things that has happened has been that Wall Street finance has become so complex and the internal systems of Wall Street banks have become so complex that if you are a smart um, banker who is out to maximize your own income, you can find the loopholes in the system and you can exploit them even if it means taking money from your own, from your own company.